Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar on how to support a remote workforce. I'm Veronica. I'm the business development manager for our Jamf Now solution, and I've been a, a remote employee here with Jamf. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, my colleague Chaz, uh, and today we're going to be telling you a little bit about how uh, we can help adapt to change in these ever-changing times. So this here uh, is a map of the United States. I live here in New York City. Uh, this is my little part of the world that gets uh, often shared with tourists, New Yorkers, and business people uh, that are here on business travel. And our Jamf headquarters is a three-hour plane ride uh, located right in the heart of Minneapolis. Five years ago, before I joined Jamf, I was working at the Apple retail store on Fifth Avenue, the big Q. Uh, you should definitely visit it the next time you find yourself in New York. But many times we'd get customers asking us to perform at home visits or help with troubleshooting at home. Um, and while I wasn't able to do that, the Apple Care team would be able to help customers outside of the Apple Store. Really, my experience at Jamf has taught me that there are so many tools out there that can help us stay connected, productive, and helpful to one another, no matter where in the world we are. In the five years that I've worked at Jamf, I've always been a remote employee working out of my home. I've been able to collaborate with people at Jamf headquarters in Minneapolis, as well as with colleagues in tons of different time zones like Australia, London, Mexico City, and a number of other cities that you see right here up on screen. But uh, our work patterns have changed, uh, at least here in the United States, and have changed dramatically over the past several decades, not to mention over just the past few weeks. And so the office was the central location for a number of resources that we use in our day-to-day -day work. Things like telephones, fax machines, equipment like our desks and computers, conference rooms, files and data, including servers, our coworkers, as well as other departments, and even our homes revolve around the office. Today, our landlines are replaced by mobile phones, uh, typically an iPhone, that's my preference. <laughs> we can take a call really anywhere in the world. We use email to send and receive messages and documents. Uh, no longer do we need to go to a machine to fetch our documents. They really just come to us anywhere where we have email connected device. Our desk can be anything from a couch in a coffee shop to a kitchen table to a chair on an outside patio. And online meeting tools still give us the opportunity to meet face to face using cameras, microphones, and speakers that are built into a lot of the technology that we use today. And all of our data is stored on servers. Uh, many of those servers are in the cloud, accessible 24 hours a day, with most services providing 99.9% .9 of time, backup, and around the clock monitoring and remediation. And we communicate with our coworkers extensively over chat without needing to interrupt what we're doing and leave our desk. All of these advances in technology have allowed us to change our work patterns so that our work no longer depends on us having to revolve around the office. Now we can keep what's most important at the center of our lives, which is our home, and bring the world to us. To make all of the work and implement remote support for your end users, uh, requires what we know and how to provide them with the right tools, the right access, and to make sure that we trust that access. We have to equip them with the devices that serve multiple purposes, like our iPhones, our iPads, and our Macs, right? A laptop and a smartphone is always a good start. The next thing we would need to think about is the right software and settings for those devices. We need to give them access to the data and services to do their job. Uh, that could mean opening up your network to allow them to connect and come in or 
It could mean securely storing your data in a service on the internet. And we have to ensure that the right people and the right machines can access the right resources. That doesn't mean that we have to lower our security standards, but it may mean that we do have to rethink our security standards and meet them in a new way. So are you all ready to support remote workers? Uh, today we want to tell you a little bit about how Jamf can help. And so once a MacBook, an iPhone, or an iPad leaves your office network, it could be just a few miles away or in a completely different country. But the question is, do you have the right infrastructure in place to be able to manage that device and support your end user anywhere in the world? We'll look at how Jamf now plays into that infrastructure. How do you ensure the data on those devices stays safe if a device gets lost or stolen? How do you ensure that the right person is even using that device? And we'll discuss some of the tools um, that we offer that can help do that for you. Then we need to think about how do we employ, uh, excuse me, how do we help employees collaborate with each other? Device management and security go a long way towards protecting your organization's confidential information, but our end users still need to be able to work together as if they were in the same office. Uh, and finally, many of us are here today because we have never considered or planned for the events that are happening right now around the world. The ability for anyone to self-sequester and work from home due to the COVID-19 coronavirus will keep many businesses operating. We have a very important role as business owners, office administrators, de facto IT admins uh, in making that happen. And so how do we now support business as unusual, right? We're not sure uh, when a lot of this will be over, and so we want to help give you the tools uh, to continue working uh, if you're able to. And so at the end of this webinar, we'll provide some links and resources around what we cover today, including uh, that link to the recording of this webinar. But before we begin, uh, for those of you that are new to Jan, here is a quick summary of what we do. Uh, Jamf has a single goal, and that's to help organizations succeed with Apple. And we've been doing so since 2002, so quite a few years in this space. We've come a long way since then. <laughs> Today, Jamf offers a portfolio of solutions ready to help you tackle things like authentication, device management, and endpoint protection needs that exist in the Apple ecosystem. Today's presentation will focus on how you can use Jamf Now, our small to medium business solution, to support a remote workforce. You can also view the more in-depth version of this webinar that showcases Jamf Pro, our enterprise solution, in case that ends up being a better fit for your needs today. Uh, the link to that webinar will be included in that follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow, so be sure to take a look. Underpinning it all is Jamf Nation, uh, the world's largest community of Apple administrators with more than 100,000 of your fellow admins on the site ready to help you connect, learn, and grow. So if you haven't signed up for Jamf Nation, please feel free to do so after this webinar today. So let's get started and review some of the basics about how your devices communicate with Jamf Now. Uh, it's meant to be super simple since Jamf Now takes full advantage of the cloud. In reality, there's one key component to ensuring your devices are in communication with Jamf now while they're out in different locations. Apple Push Notification Service, or APNS, is what we use to securely communicate with the devices that you have enrolled with Jamf now. Since Jamf now is in the cloud, there's not much else that you'll need to configure. Your users will simply need a Wi-Fi or carrier network connection to receive the apps and settings from Jamf now. I'm going to pass it over to Chaz, who's going to uh, go a little bit more in depth with some of this information with us. So, Chaz, take it away. Thank you very much, Veronica. I had to unmute myself, so sorry about the minimization there. Hey, everyone, uh, got a lot of content to go over, so um, no better time to start than right now. And as Veronica had mentioned, APNS is the uh, medium that your devices use to communicate with Jamf, as well as Jamf's medium to communicate with your devices. So um, it's a secure service that pretty much vets information coming from a server like Jamf now before it gets down to the device. 
to make sure whatever action is trying to be done to a device is from a trusted source. Here's how Jamf uh, now works. Once APNS has been configured in your account, on the left is an end user's home. And with that end user are an iPhone and a MacBook Pro. On the right is Jamf Cloud, our hosted Jamf Now service. If you're already using Jamf Now, there's nothing more to do. Your devices can reach your Jamf Now management server, and you have the ability to deploy packages and settings anywhere in the world. Pretty darn neat. And once our management infrastructure is ready and secure, we have to consider making our devices secure when they're not on our network, protected by our firewalls, proxies, and other security tools. So what exactly does making them secure mean? How do we know the right people are using these devices? How do we protect the data on these devices? How do we keep software up to date? What happens if, if a device gets lost or stolen? Those are all things that we'll be uh, talking about during this presentation. We'll need to ensure the right people are using the right devices. Uh, we'll look at how Apple Business Manager helps with that. We'll also need to protect the data on the devices from accidental or intentional exposure or loss. Basic protections are already built into the macOS operating system itself, but unless we keep it and our, our applications up to date, we're losing a lot of security benefits. And what also happens if a device gets lost or stolen? Do you have a plan to help your end users who are probably very reluctant to report this to you? All great questions, and again, all topics that we'll be going over during this presentation. In many parts of the world, there's an expression that possession is nine-tenths of the law, which means ownership of something is easier to maintain if someone has possession of it. So let's start with ownership, and let's start with an Apple Business Manager account or Apple School Manager if you're a K-12 or higher education school. An Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager account is about maintaining something called chain of custody. This is a term described the documented transfer of responsibility of something from one entity to another. It, in police work, for example, chain of custody is used to ensure evidence is collected at the crime scene and is transferred only between authoritative figures to ensure it's intact and untampered with when it comes to trial. Only Apple makes Apple devices and everyone has a unique serial number. When Apple transfers new devices to a reseller for distribution, it keeps a record of the serial number sold to that reseller. In turn, when the reseller sells you the device, it too keeps a record of the serial number sold to you and adds them to your Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager account. Then Apple allows you to associate an MDM server to, or like Jamf Now to it. Once your Jamf Now server is associated to that account, Apple will recognize your server as legally authoritative to those devices. This is the role that Apple Business Manager or Apple School Manager plays in your device management. Uh, if you haven't signed up for one of these free accounts, you should definitely do so. Can't stress that enough. From here, once, once uh, you purchase these devices, you control the chain of custody with automated device enrollment. For you Windows admins out there, this is the equivalent to Windows Autopilot, which is Microsoft's automated enrollment service. With your devices associated with Jeff Now, Apple will let you control the setup assistant experience for your end users so you can streamline the experience for them. Jamf Now will automatically configure devices based on these settings you selected for those devices in your account, and the end user will be ready to get to work. The beauty is that these devices are always in communication with uh, the Jamf Now server. Users cannot disassociate a device enrolled with Apple Business Manager from your Jamf Now account, which means if Veronica tells me she's never received her device and I sent her one, but you see it's enrolled in Jamf now, you can quickly take action to lock that device from a remote location and uh, also determine its, its location as well. Apple Business Manager and the fantastic tool that it is, it grants you so many great features, including auto enrollment, uh, wireless supervision, which pretty much grants you all the capabilities of MDM that Jamf now has to offer. And another key point is that the, the profile is non-removable, which is a big deal. So when in doubt, Apple Business Manager is surely the best practice to gain the most control over your devices. But say you're in a situation where devices already are out on the field or you'd like users to enroll their own personal device, also known as BYOD. Um, 
you could actually give them the access to the right software and security and settings they need right away. And that would be through open enrollment. Uh, the only downside and the only thing that's really important to note is that open enrolled devices will not automatically be supervised and the profile that JF now installs will be removable. So that's why, you know, when you have access to business manager, always go with that. But open enrollment is a fallback that you have access to as well. Now, let's spend some time discussing how to protect devices after they're configured. By default, Mac OS requires password creation during the setup assistant. But anyone with admin privileges can make password changes as they please. Uh, using an MDM like Jamf now will provide you with administrative control over password management across your entire Mac fleet, which is very valuable. In Jamf now, just navigate to Blueprints in the upper left-hand corner. Choose security on the left side, and then you can add a passcode payload by checking the box to require passcode. From here, you have a variety of options for your password policy, and these are the settings on this page that I have here that I would recommend. We suggest setting the minimum passcode length to the highest possible number, which is 16 characters. Now, you may be saying, but Chaz, my users will revolt if I set it that high. My answer to you, is that uh, requiring longer, easy to remember passwords in lieu of any sort of password complexity. If you look closely, I'm not requiring any uppercase, lowercase numbers or symbols. And that's because research has shown uh, that it's not the complexity of the password that makes it secure, it's the length. But of course, this is all up to your preference at the end of the day as a JAMPDAO administrator. But just to dig into that previous statement regarding the differences between password length and complexity, let's take a look at this next slide. So here are two passwords. Uh, the top one has a complexity requirement of an uppercase and lowercase, a symbol and a number, it's eight characters long. You've even tried to get tricky and substitute a zero for the letter O in Thomas. The bottom one on the other hand is 16 characters, all lowercase, and as a touch typist, I can enter it just as quickly as the password above. Furthermore, it's a phrase which is easier to remember and I don't have to leave this on a sticky note under my keyboard due to the familiarity and the, the remember, uh, how easy it is to remember. But here's why a longer but easier to remember password is better than a shorter and complex password. It would take a computer running a password cracker nine hours to, to determine the top password, whereas the bottom password due to its length would require 51 million years to crack the second one. I don't know about you, I think 51 million years is a little bit longer than nine hours. Uh, so I thought I'd share that insightful math for you. A password does us no good if we don't lock our devices. So I recommend auto locking max after about 20 minutes. You know, and, and with remote workers, you may even want to reduce that to about five or 10 minutes, depending on your situation. I like to add a grace period of about a minute when I'm setting the auto lock time because uh, I want it to be something low. This gives the end user a minute to, to wiggle their mouse or press a key to, to unlock the screen and not require them to enter in a passcode. This, say, this setting is, is valuable because it saves a lot of frustration on the end user so they don't have to have their computer lock and have to enter in the password right away. It gives them a little bit of a grace time to, to stop the screensaver before they have to enter in the admin password. When it comes to iOS, you should consider one to two minutes uh, for auto locking uh, an iOS device. This is useful in case the device is left at, uh, uh, left at a coffee shop. That way the chances remain low that someone can gain access to the data on the device because the device will just lock after a minute of not being used. And lastly, uh, for higher secure organizations, I recommend setting the device to erase after uh, a maximum number of failed passcode attempts. 11 is the highest number and should be good enough to allow for several tries before the end user calls the help desk. Just one thing to note is, is this restriction, it's easy to set it and forget it. And if you run into situations where devices are just randomly becoming erased, um, it may be, may be due to the setting being enabled. So keep that in mind if you ever do decide to enable it. And here's another way to protect accounts. This would be more for, for Mac specifically. By default, anyone, including a standard user or a complete stranger, can take a Mac and hold down a couple of keys while we're starting it to reset your admin password. That means he or she can gain full control of the computer and possibly more access to your company resources. 
you can leverage file vaults and the recovery key that file vault generates uh, to avoid running into the situation. And getting into that now, the best way to protect your admin account from someone booting into macOS recovery is to simply enable file vaults. When it's enabled, whoever is attempting to reset your password must either provide the admin password or provide the recovery key that is set when file vaults is enabled. Without either of those, your admin account is safe from being reset. Uh, and not only does file vault protect your admin account, it protects all the data on your Mac. If your remote workers deal with sensitive information, like company secrets, customer data, hospital patient records, et cetera, then you probably will want to encrypt the data uh, if it ever comes to rest on the computer. And that's what file vaults can, can bring you. I want to point out that before you turn on file vault, you want to make sure you're capturing the recovery key. This is a long string of characters uh, that enables someone in IT to unlock the Mac if the end user ever forgets his or her password or leaves your organization without telling you the password. To do that requires you to deploy a setting at the same time that you enable file vaults. And to look into that, uh, for Mac OS High Sierra 10.13 and higher, you'll do that uh, in the security section of your blueprint. This will ensure that JFNow tells your Mac to turn on file vault once they enroll into JFNow. The encryption and recovery key process will activate once the user logs out and logs back in. This normally happens over time as the user does their, their daily tasks. For devices that already had file vault turned on, you'll see a status that we see on the screen right here where it says file vault is enabled, but recovery key is not being escrowed. If that ever happens, the most likely causation of that um, is the Mac being encrypted before JFNOW management was ever placed on that. And if that is the case, all you need to do is utilize this link right under, right in the same tile uh, as the error. And what this link will do is to direct you to our Help Center article that runs you through how to generate a new file vault recovery key uh, so Jamf now, when it's when it's managing the Mac, can get notified of that key and store it on our servers. To generate a new key, you just have to run this terminal command that we have listed on the top right-hand corner. It'll ask you for admin uh, username, admin password. You see the new personal recovery key get generated. As long as Jamf now has that file vault profile on the Mac, we should see that recovery key get stored on the next inventory with Jamf now. Devices that don't have file vault key escrowed in JF now will display a red dot on the dashboard. And we can use this filter, oh, excuse me, uh, we can use this filter to, which is a need, needs attention filter to kind of filter and just show you max that, that need attention and, and most likely are not storing the recovery key. So here's a quick recap on the workflow to enable file vault to keep our admin accounts and company data secure from incoming attacks. One thing to note, once file vault is turned on, it may take several minutes to a few hours to encrypt the disk. And it's perfectly okay if the end user restarts or sleeps their computer by closing the lid of the laptop. Encryption will continue from where it left off the next time the Mac is active. Access to the, reco access to the recovery key is critical to this workflow. Don't forget to check your inventory and ensure your Macs have reported their last recovery keys or reported their recovery keys back in the draft now. You'll find the recovery key in the computer's record inventory section under disk encryption. You'll see a pop-up that displays that key after you click on show recovery key. So that, is, that would be how you would go about viewing that recovery key. Should you enable fire, and this is kind of switching subjects now from, from file vault, but something in the same respect of making sure our computers are protected. Should we enable file or firewall on our Macs? If your Mac is ever leaving your network and won't be protected by your network firewall, then yes. You'll do this to your computer using custom profiles in JFNow Plus. This feature leverages programs like Apple Configurator or iMazing to create custom profiles for devices to apply over the air with JFNow. So for this example in this presentation, we'll be using iMazing to, to generate those profiles. So we'll uh, first, I guess, start by downloading it. But once it's downloaded and we have it on our computer, we can open it and we'll use the firewall payload to create our setting. Simply click add configuration profile to activate and click enable firewall. Remember a firewall's purpose is to prevent unwanted incoming connections 
This means it doesn't stop installed and signed software like Microsoft Auto Update for updating Office applications or Zoom for teleconferencing from reaching out to, to servers and downloading files or making connections. Even AirDrop works just fine. So anything incoming, that's where the firewall comes into play. Anything outgoing or is already on your Mac, you know, firewall is not preventing that. Finally, I also suggest you enable stealth mode. This is especially handy for home workers who may choose to visit a local coffee shop to work for a while and use their public network. Stealth mode mainly prevents someone else on the same network from scanning the computer's open ports and looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, the Mac just won't respond since stealth mode's enabled. So another valuable tidbit of information I can share regarding firewalls. Next step is to save the profile and make note of where you saved it. You know, these files will be the dot mobile config extension. So that's what you're going to want to look for. Leave the sign with profile at do not sign because JF now will do all the signing for the profile. You can then upload it into JF now with your blueprint under custom profiles. Remember, this option is only available for JF now plus subscription. So you won't see custom profiles unless you're on the plus plan. So something to keep in mind, you'll click add and then upload. And then it's that easy. The last piece of protecting data is safeguarding it against accidental deletions, hardware, hardware malfunctions, uh, or malware. To keep in mind, uh, we need to keep in mind that end users won't be able to work off the server, which is getting backed up while at home. Even over a VPN connection with high speed internet, this can be a painful experience. All solutions are gonna be, or all solutions are going to be at least one of two choices. We either need to set up end users to back up to a cloud service, or we provide them with guidance for configuring a local backup uh, storage solution. A cloud solution is ideal because it transfers data offsite to a server infrastructure that's getting maintained. Most importantly, not maintained by you, but maintained by third party. If you have nothing in place to support either a cloud or local backup solution, you at least have iCloud and every Apple ID comes with five gigs of storage. It's not a lot, but it's better than nothing that's already integrated with Mac OS and iOS. For a small cost per account, you can always buy more storage. I think it's two terabits for $10 a month. This works uh, if you allow your end users to, to use their personal Apple IDs on devices because they can manage all their iCloud backups themselves using that Apple ID. For those, for those of us using Apple Business Manager, also Apple School Manager, you can create managed Apple IDs for your end users that do not have an Apple ID. Uh, managed Apple IDs do have limitations, so it won't work as a standard consumer Apple ID like we're used to. But the major benefit is iCloud can still be used for backups with these type of Apple IDs. So if your end goal is just backing up, you know, uh, creating backups for your devices, these managed Apple IDs are perfect for that. All you need to do is have your end users turn it on. Uh, this isn't something that it can be managed to. So any of these backups would need to be done on an individual basis for the device. Uh, cloud sharing services like Dropbox and Microsoft OneDrive make good pseudo backups solutions because you may already be using them. Most offer business pricing, central management, cross-platform support, multi-device support, and versioning as well. You can even retrieve versions for up to 180 days with Dropbox or 30 days with OneDrive. And another even tidbit of information is you can even use JF now to deploy and manage both OneDrive and, Drop, and Dropbox, Dropbox desktop apps using volume purchasing. So you just get licenses of those apps, deploy them to your devices using JF now and kind of integrate it a little bit further with, with JF now in that regard. Finally, for a local backup solution, Time Machine is is solid and time tested. It's the fastest backup solution you can implement because it's backing up over USB or Thunderbolt and it's easy to set up. Just plug in an external drive and if it's empty, Time Machine is smart enough and, and smart enough to detect that and will offer to use it as a backup drive. And we even recommend use, utilizing the backup automatically checkbox for future backups to occur automatically whenever you plug in that same drive. Most end users can do this themselves. All you need to do is provide them with an inexpensive external drive. You can put together a short list of drives you recommend and either let them order it online or you can order in bulk and, and always ship it out to your users. But this would be a, a, a recommendation for what it would look like to back up machines locally.
So let's turn on, or let's turn now to software, uh, turn to the software running on your devices. Above all else, the best protection you can give them is to simply keep your software up to date. And let's start with OS updates. An option for your Macs is to enable every option here in the software update pane and system preferences. The first three are the most important. The enabling checks for updates turned on by your Mac's built-in update system. Without it, your remote workers would be responsible for checking for software updates themselves. Allowing for the Mac to do these checks automatically will save users time and effort. While your remote users are, work, are, are while your remote workers are using the Mac, it can silently download new updates in the background and get them ready. This saves your end users time because they do not have to wait for the updates. The updates will come to the, come to them when they're ready. And lastly, this option uh, to install macOS updates is is the critical piece. Our philosophy when uh, about when to install updates is that we should include what works for the end users. We shouldn't be enforcing software updates while they're working, but we shouldn't allow them to have full control over whether they install updates or not. This is a nice compromise because it notifies them that updates are available and will be installed during the night. All your end users have to do is keep their Macs powered and powered on and plugged in. You can also eliminate a step for your end users by prompting the macOS backward. Uh, excuse me. You can also eliminate a step for your end users by prompting the macOS update download on their behalf through Champ Now. One thing to keep in mind is pushing macOS updates through Champ Now does require the Mac to be auto enrolled into Champ Now. So auto enrolled Macs would be the only Macs that you could push these updates um, via Champ Now, and that's kind of what the the macOS update looks like once once the end user receives it when it details, and then the installation process will begin. iOS updates uh, are different a little bit compared to macOS. By default, Apple prompts the end user that an update is available for iOS devices. We as Jamf now admins don't have much control over that other than delaying the update up to 90 days. After that, Apple will be persistent in notifying your iOS users that updates are, are ready to install. If you don't notice many, uh, if you don't notice, if you do notice many of your devices are behind on updates or just unequal, you can send a command to update the operating system. It's important to note that uh, the update will not install automatically for devices with the passcode set. The user will have to initiate the install themselves under the settings app. So Jamf now, we push the download to the device, the end user and the device, they receive that command and installs the update, and then the user will just need to go in there and uh, initiate that update themselves. You can also prompt the download for all eligible devices with available updates. Uh, this will be available in the dashboard of Jamf now by clicking the three dots in the upper right-hand corner and selecting install updates. So right on the screen, upper right-hand corner, after you click it, it will show a full list of devices that have available updates. When an update is ready, your end users will receive a subtle prompt as a badge notification on the settings app. After a while, Apple will display a notification on the screen suggesting to install now or schedule to install later. Your users can then see the download has already been completed since we pushed that through Jamf now. Jamf now did its heavy lifting of downloading that update and they can simply click install to finish that upgrade uh, to, for their operating system. Your end users can also enable automatic app, uh, automatic updates themselves in settings, although this isn't a manageable setting. You can certainly point that out uh, to them so their devices, you know, be like, hey, you can also enable this setting and just push this, or have app updates, on, or sorry, not app updates, OS updates happen automatically. So food for thought. Moving to, to loss mode and devices being being uh, misplaced or, or missing. You know, as a consequence of devices leaving the office, there's a much greater risk of them being lost or stolen. Making a plan now for how to react when something like, like that happens is very valuable. Apple has built-in management capabilities to help you find missing iPads and iPhones, but not yet find the missing Macs. So only iOS devices, Macs can't currently use loss mode, which is an MDM function of Jamf now. You should consider whether you want to allow your end users um, to be able to use the Find My app that comes today with most Apple devices. We'll touch on a few points with this. 
And don't forget, you have the ability to send remote commands to devices to lock them or erase them. When an end user comes to you and says, hey, uh, my, my iPhone is, is, is lost, you can enable lost mode under the management section of the device record. And it's uh, important to note that this feature is only available for supervised devices, supervised devices as well. If the device is truly lost, you know, maybe it was left behind in a coffee shop or in a taxi cab, then offering a small reward for its return is something worth considering. Note the wording says found and returned. This puts a condition on the reward that you must gain physical possession of the device. You know, and you could also keep in mind that you may need to send a small package in case you you know you want this device back. Help them help you return this device. When the device goes into lost mode, that's initiated by JF. Now it displays this message uh, that you initiated when lost mode was sent. This is all customizable and can be used to you know in a, in a, with with the helping of the the return of this device. And GF now reports on the lost mode status and the device's inventory information under security. Note the last location, which displays GPS coordinates of its approximate location. These coordinates only appear when the device is in lost mode. Clicking these coordinates will open up Apple Maps to show you the location on a map, or you can paste them into a, a, another service like Google Maps. So some, something to take note of. And the second part is considering whether you should allow end users to sign into the Apple ID to allow uh, for access like Find My and, and Location Services. Allowing this empowers your end users to help themselves before having to reach out to your service desk and report the device's loss is stolen. You know, if they, if they dropped it in between their couch cushions, you may want to give them the ability to find that device in those couch cushions before reaching out to IT for then you to enable loss mode for them to hear this beeping coming from their couch. Uh, might as well see if they can do that on their own before reaching out to you. Even if your like organization has a policy against using iCloud, you can use restrictions to granularly dis disallow most iCloud services under iCloud while still allowing uh, for other iCloud services that benefit your organization. If you take advantage of managed Apple IDs for business, you can control the Apple ID signing into iCloud. If you ultimately decide you want to restrict users from using Find My iPhone, you could turn it off and disable Find My device under the security and privacy of the restrictions menu, found right on your screen, right in front of you. As a matter of last resort, you have two more options. Both Mac OS and iOS devices support the lock command. This command for Macs actually restarts the computer and enables a firmware passcode that, uh, that you provide as part of the command. Use the lock computer command when you expect the Mac is simply lost and may be returned to you. An iOS device, when using the lock command, will simply just lock to the passcode and require that to, to use the device. Again, consider offering a small reward as an incentive. Uh, it probably will increase your likelihood of getting this device back. But if you feel like recovering your Mac is not going to be possible, you could take the most dramatic approach, which is send a wipe computer command, which will not only erase all the data, but the entire operating system itself. This too, this too will require a six digit firmware passcode, just as like an extra layer of, of uh, security. For iOS devices, uh, wipe command simply uh, will erase the user data on the device. Even if someone goes through the effort of restoring an operating system, so as long as you're using the automated, automated device enrollment, devices will always remain in communication with Jamf now and be re-enrolled during the setup. So send the erase device command, when that device sets back up, it'll try to auto-enroll back into Jamf now. So you kind of, again, that, that's even going back to the chain of custody. You are the owner of this device. This isn't a comprehensive list of everything you can do to protect your devices off the network, but it's certainly the fundamentals uh, if you find yourself suddenly supporting remote workers like we all are during these COVID times. GF now offers you end-to-end -end management and security anywhere in the world, which is, is crazy to think of, and it's a, it's a great time to be alive uh, and, and have access to the technology that we do during these uncertain times. So and that was probably a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of a lot of me talking and, and hopefully 
the information that I provided will assist you in, in, in better setting your organization up for supporting these remote workers. And with that being said, I'll see you in a couple slides down. I'm going to be handing it back off to Veronica. We'll be talking about facilitating collaboration. Thank you, Chaz. Now that we know how to prepare devices to ensure that they're secure and that our users have everything that they need, now we might be looking for ways to help our remote workers work with each other. And so now we have to think about what is better, putting together our own set of solutions and choosing to support an ecosystem We'll cover some thoughts about how a piecemeal set of tools can offer a crafted experience where a build set of tools are just made to work together. So we live in a world of modern tools that replaced a lot of old technology that kept us tethered to the office, uh, not the show, but the office that, uh, that you walk into every day to get to work. Our new model where our tools revolve around us instead of revolving around the office means that there are just now links that bind us in our jobs. And so we think about different ways that we can collaborate with our employees, with our end users, with uh, our colleagues. And it's not just phone, but it's also email, chat, cloud-based files, video conferencing, so many things that keep us connected. Several solution providers make at least one of the tools and many make multiple tools often blurring the lines between them and always making their own tools work better together rather than mix with other solutions. So there's an ecosystem for everything and an app for everything out there. Here are just a few thoughts about what I see, what we see when we talk with customers and partners. If we review some of the major collaboration tools that are out there, we'll see names we all know very well. The three major players are Apple, Google, and Microsoft. Uh, they've developed this suite of products and have created ecosystems where their tools work great when used together. For example, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, and Word have auto-save and document collaboration features, but they'll only work if you store your files on Microsoft OneDrive, so that collaboration between all of the Microsoft products. Or take Apple's feature, for example, for making custom animated emojis, one of my favorite things to do. They're cute and they're fun, uh, but only work effectively if the people you're chatting with also have iPhones or iPads. And while it's fair to say that these three companies have targeted three major markets of business, consumer, and education, each has a dominance in one over the other. Apple has a focus heavily on the consumer, Google has a focus heavily on education, and Microsoft has focused heavily on business. When we look at each of their product lines, you'll see that there's no discernible differences in the types of services that they offer. It's their client applications where they differ most. Apple chose to develop separate clients for chat, email, and group video, whereas Microsoft combines it all, chat, audio, and conferencing, into their one Teams app. Google has invested its work into mostly online-only services where you need to use the browser on your Mac. Other than its Google Drive app for cloud files, it has a few thick clients you can install, which means it can't take much advantage of features like Spotlight for searching something that comes with a Mac operating system. Altogether, if your needs aren't heavily dependent on one type of service, but you need multiple services, then one of these is probably a good fit for you. If you're on a tight budget, Apple's ecosystem probably makes the most sense, uh, but you're not gonna get a lot of bells and whistles that are useful for a business. If you need more business-focused ecosystem with cross-platform support, then Google and Microsoft are the better option. If you have a heavy dependency on very specific services like file sharing, chat, or teleconferencing, then a dedicated solution might be the better choice for you. These usually excel in one or two key areas while offering basic or no support in others. This is why you see most are heavily targeting businesses with little focus on consumer and education customers. Box and Dropbox are both great file sharing and transfer platforms, and their power is in their ability to share files both within organizations and outside, a tool I've used many, many times before. Traditionally, network administrators have managed servers with file shares 
and they were the only ones who could control access to files. So for new employees, that meant waiting for their paperwork to get processed and their user accounts to get added to the correct groups before they can leverage these tools. And there could often be hundreds of thousands of groups in large organizations, so that's a lot of people to manage. Services like Box and Dropbox put the power of sharing in the end user's hands, uh, while allowing administrators some control over what could be shared and with whom. And while Slack is the most popular chat platform available for business, and it has teleconferencing features, its focus is not teleconferencing. The power for each of these three services is their integrations with other tools. For example, Slack offers integrations to bring notifications from dozens of other services into one window for everything, something I've personally used and has been super helpful for me to stay on top of a lot of things. Uh, WebEx and Zoom offer integrations with your calendar to plan and schedule meetings as well as manage conference rooms. Overall, if your organization doesn't have a deep need for one or two of these specific services, then one of the three ecosystems will probably suit you just fine. However, if you find an ecosystem isn't satisfying some of your servicing needs, uh, then you'll want to look at supplementing it with another service that's focused in that area. And so hopefully this gives you a nice idea of uh, some suggestions or some of the stuff that folks are doing. So I'm going to pass it over back to Chad, who's our uh, tech wizard, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how we can deploy some of these tools. Thank you again, Veronica. The tech wizard uh, comments is very much appreciated. It makes me feel special. So yeah, let's go over uh, some different things uh, that you'll do to support these collaboration tools. In this case, we're going to be using Zoom as our uh, demonstration tool. For the most part, uh, they're apps just like any other. I'm going to use Zoom web conferencing tool as an example uh, for what you can do. First, I need to deploy Zoom to my users. And to do that, uh, we can use the link actually shared on this page. And this is where you can find the most recent installer for Zoom on your Macs. Again, I'll include this in the resources at the end of the webinar, so no need to try to copy that down. Uh, and this workflow requires custom apps and packages, which are both JF Now Plus uh, uh, features. So, so supporting collaboration tools. Once we do have access to that Dropbox, uh, or sorry, not Dropbox, to the Zoom installer, we can go ahead and, and click Add Apps. We'll go to upload the app into JF Now under the section that we see on the screen. And what that'll do is allow us to upload the Zoom installer into JF now to deploy to our to our managed Max. And once Zoom launches, your end users will see messages like these that will be shown on the next page. And it's important to understand what you can and cannot control. So these are the these prompts that I was referring to. Um, when an application requests to access another application or process on the Mac, or to a location like files on the computer or use downloads folder, you can manage this using privacy preferences policy control, also known as PPPC, and try to say that five times fast, I dare you, it's not fun. However, there are types of requests an app can make that aren't manageable. And those are requests for like the microphone and the camera, as we see here, and for screen captures like QuickTime, recording on your desktop, what can we do about these messages, the ones that Jamf now can't manage? For non-manageable requests, you'll need to educate yourself and your end users about what they mean and how to respond. These alerts should only appear for the first time that an app is launched. So app launches, needs to make sure it can do whatever it wants to do on the Mac. That's where these users are presented with these pop-ups. When they click OK uh, or Don't Allow button, their choice is listed under the Privacy tab in Security and Privacy pane and System Preferences, as we can see on the screen. Note the icon in the lower left corner shows this pane is locked. That generally means changing settings requires an administrator uh, privileges. However, certain items on this list can left belong to users and are completely under their control. So some require admin to make a change, some don't. So if a user accidentally clicks don't allow when prompted to allow Zoom to access their camera, he or she can come into this pane and enable the camera just by clicking the box next to Zoom. That's all it takes. For manageable requests, like access to, to the user's downloads folder, we could circle back and, and 
bring up iMazing again, which is that uh, custom profile creation tool. And we can use that to create uh, a payload for PPPC preferences. This would require, again, custom profiles, which is available in JFNOW Plus. You would scroll down and you could select uh, the system policy downloads folder and click on the plus to add Zoom, add Zoom to this list. You then follow the same steps we took in the custom profile for firewall uh, to JFNOW. And just to kind of show you what that looks like, here's when you hit plus, you choose the application that we're trying to allow access to the downloads folder. In this case, it's Zoom um, right here. And then once selected, the final step would be to enter the code requirement that we see right on this page. So each, uh, each application will have its own unique code requirement. Uh, and this can be typically uh, obtained from the app developers documentation that they have on their website. So we wouldn't have access to that. We would just reach out to Zoom, say, hey, what's a code requirement for, for PPPC? And, and it's probably hosted somewhere on the internet. And we'll actually, we'll make sure to include that in the, the follow-up documentation as well, in case you're trying to deploy Zoom and, and set up PPPC profiles for Zoom. Uh, those are the high points for facilitating collaboration between you and your end users. I'm sure they'll have uh, opinions about what they want to use and you should listen to them, definitely listen to them. Uh, it's it's not our place to choose the tools to do the job, but we should offer guidance about what makes sense. So this is what we'll see a lot of admins do in JF now. We took note of that and kind of continue to share that information. And uh, again, at the end of the day, it's kind of up to you as an administrator on how, you know, gathering all the information, what are you trying to do? What are your users doing? How sensitive and how protected should we make that information or that content or that data? All great questions to ask. And without further ado, I'll flip it back to Veronica to close out this presentation. So thanks again, Veronica. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chad. Uh, that is our presentation for you all today. We really hope you found it useful. And I know we're just a few minutes over time. But just to recap, we covered how Jamf now works with APNS. There's not much you need to do. Just keep that up to date. Then we covered ways to protect our devices and our data when we may not even get the opportunity to touch them. Uh, using Apple Business Manager, this is zero touch. Finally, we discussed ways to help our end users collaborate with one another and what it takes to support these tools and to support business as unusual for however much longer <laughs> we'll be in our homes. We'll show you some resources on the next slide and our follow-up email will include a few things we pointed out today along with the recording of today's webinar. But if you ever find yourself needing some more resources, you are always welcome to join another webinar. We've got recurring Jamf Now 101 for beginners, how to set up Jamf Now if you're just getting started, and special topics like the one today. You can find knowledge-based articles, how-tos, and troubleshooting tips for Jamf Now in the Help Center. And finally, our great support team, including Chaz, is available to all customers via live chat at support.jamfnow.com or directly within your Jamf Now account. They are available 24-5. If you need phone support, you can upgrade your account to Jamf Now Plus under your account setting. So thanks so much for listening all. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. If you'd like to get started with Jamf Now, just scan the QR code that's up on the screen here with your camera on your smartphone.